Hello everyone, I'm Kathy Vergolito, a volunteer with AARP Washington, and I live in Shoreline. Welcome to our Get Fit, Be Well series of events with four-time WNBA champion, the Seattle Storm. AARP's partnership with the Storm is all about wellness and well-being, and mental health is just as important as our physical health. More and more research is showing how important it is to deal with stress in a positive way and how critical it is to reach out for help if you need it. Today, we'll talk about how WNBA players have been dealing with playing professional basketball during the time of COVID-19. That's quite a challenge, but then all of us have been dealing with challenges every day. It's time to talk about staying mentally and emotionally well. We've got a great panel for you, so let's get started. Hello, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Tatiana Sadak, and I'm an associate professor of geriatric mental health and a director of graduate education and dementia and palliative education network at the University of Washington School of Nursing Seattle campus. My personal and professional life have been significantly affected by the global pandemic. I had to very quickly transition to teaching, doing research, seeing patients virtually. I had to create new ways to stay connected and supporting my students, faculty, friends, family, and to create new daily structure and routine of self-care practices. So today I am very excited to moderate a discussion and to learn from a very accomplished athlete and mental health advocate a healthcare professional, administrator, and a champion of well-being, and a health longevity expert and a thought leader about their personal and professional challenges, silver linings, and triumphs, and to learn about their recommendations for our audience on how to maintain championship mindset and optimal wellness during the time of physical distancing. Today, our speakers are Seattle Storm's Katie Lou Samuelson, she is in her third WNBA season and her first as a member of Seattle Storm. Prior to WNBA, Samuelson spent four years at the University of Connecticut, where she won NCAA championship in 2016 and earned many accolades, including being named as AP First Team All-American twice and earning AAC Player of the Year recognition as a junior and senior. Off the court, She's an advocate for mental health and wellness awareness. Our next speaker is Dr. Arpan Wagre. He is a geriatric psychiatrist who serves as an executive medical director for behavioral health at Swedish Health System. He has been featured in Seattle Magazine and Seattle Met as one of the area's top doctors. He is actively involved in community activities, serving on his community YMCA board. He also currently serves as the, in the capacity of a chair-elect of the American Hospital Association's Behavioral Medicine Committee. Our next speaker is Dr. Irvin Ten. He is a physician with fellowship training in geriatric and integrative medicine and is a nationally recognized thought leader on healthy longevity, volunteering, and the health effects of, and the health effects of healthy aging. He has held leadership positions in academic, public, and nonprofit sectors. Dr. Tan is a director of Thought Leadership Health at the ARP. In this role, he is leading the work on racial and ethnic disparities in health and longevity. But we have another speaker today and another participant, and that's all of you. Right now, I see we have over 100 participants. And thank you so much to those of you at home who completed uh, a brief survey and contributed one word describing what the last year has been like for you. So now we're going to show you a slide featuring a word cloud that describes what are your thoughts about the last year in one word. So as you can see, many of you described last year as challenging, frustrating, lonely, as a roller coaster, depressing, and scary. 
these are very heavy thoughts and feelings. And before we start talking to our speakers, we want to see how you're doing right now, this moment. So we have a very quick poll for you. If you could please answer these two brief questions. Question number one, how are you feeling today, right this moment? From one being very sad, two and three and four in between, and five being very happy, beaming with joy. Please submit your answers. Great. I'm seeing that most people are feeling somewhere in between today. And some people are at the very extremes of very sad and very happy. But majority of us are feeling kind of middle of the road at the moment. Okay, so here's our numbers. 46% are at a three and 11% are beaming with joy, while 3% are feeling very, very sad. Thank you very much for completing the survey. Our next question for you is, when you think about one thing for which you are most grateful for, so just imagine this one thing and experience a sense of gratitude. And now please select the emotion you are most closely experiencing when you think about this one thing that you are grateful for. Are you feeling joy? Are you feeling serenity? Are you feeling hope? Do you feel inspired? Do you feel love? So what is one thing that you're most grateful for and what are the accompanying emotions when you think of that? And I'm seeing a lot of people endorsing love, which makes me think that you must be thinking about not just one thing, but about someone and some experience with another person um, that makes you feel the emotion of love. Next, after love, we have hope. What an important thought and emotion. Look at that. 40% experience love, 21% experience hope, 13% serenity, 15% joy, and 8% inspiration. Thank you so very much. Um, so now we know how you're feeling over the past year in general, how you're feeling today at this particular moment, and what thoughts and feelings, uh, the thoughts of gratitude uh, generate in your mind. So the goal of our time together today is to learn some new strategies and tools for capitalizing on these positive feelings of gratitude and to cultivate and to maintain the championship mindset. And we're going to start a conversation with Katie Lou Samuelson. Hello, Katie, how are you today? I'm good, how are you? It is so nice to meet you and thank you so much for your time. And I have some questions for you to start with. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? How did you fall in love with basketball and how did you become a superstar? So I'm from Huntington Beach, California. I grew up there um, all over SoCal playing basketball, but I have two older sisters who I, um, you know, just really look up to and I looked up to all my life and they started playing basketball at kind of a young age. So I was around five years old, just following them to the gym every single day and um, just doing whatever they were doing. I just wanted to really be like them. And so for me, I give them credit for where I am today because they really pushed me to be the best version of myself in basketball. And um, they've been here every step of the way. Actually, Carly just joined the Seattle Storm, my, my older sister. So we're on the team together in the WNBA. So that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. So it takes a lot more than just talent, right, to become an elite athlete what contributed to your persistence perseverance you know what inspired you to work so hard to achieve your dreams yeah i think the biggest thing was having people around me that supported me um you know just there day in day out uh, my my dad coached me for a long time growing up and 
he took me and my sisters to shoot every single day. And I think just all those hours we spent together in the gym and everything we put into um, basketball just, you know, got me to this point and being able to play it as my career is pretty amazing. So you attribute a lot of your success to community and to people around you and to the support that you received. And then mm -hmm. pandemic comes mm -hmm. and now you are in a bubble and now we are all physically distancing and you are just joining WNBA. What was it like to be a part of WNBA team when we didn't quite know exactly, you know, what to do and what was safe, what wasn't safe? What was it like playing and training in, in this bubble during pandemic? Yeah, it was, I was definitely crazy just dealing with, you know, at the beginning, we didn't know if we were going to have a season at all. And so there was a lot of just waiting around, hearing what the plan was, what we were going to do. And then they decided on having it in a bubble. And, you know, that was the most logical, the safest way that we could compete and have a season. And so that was exciting that we were going to get to play. But being in the bubble was <laughs> was a lot mentally uh, and physically. But, um, you know, one of the things that I'm proud of is, during that season, we did a lot as a league for social justice and dedicating the season to Brianna Taylor and say her name. But on the other side of things, it was a lot of time alone and a lot of time just in your room and in the gym. And that was it. Nothing else. And that's been a big shift for you, right? You're used to kind of being with people and having the social support. For sure. So how did you address, deal with those challenges? You know, what helped you get through that time when you were kind of physically and socially isolated, mm -hmm. sounds like? Yeah, I really had to talk to my family a lot on the phone and FaceTime. And uh, my sisters and I got into video games a little bit and would play together. So it was little things that could kind of get me um, away from, you know, where I was, like my mindset of trying to um, be engaged with them and distraction is always a good thing sometimes, but my family, I really lean on them a lot to get me through the bubble. And you maintain very high level of physical activity. Of course, during that time you were training, <laughs> what role do you think staying physically active played in you staying mentally, you know, well and at the top of your game? Yeah, I think, you know, being active is always something, especially for me, that helps me um, release anxiety, feel just a little bit better overall. And so um, being healthy and active gives me more energy as much as, you know, I think it is tiring to play all those hours. But, um, you know, just having more energy instead of like laying around all day long, that was actually very good to have in the bubble. We had to practice every day. So that was helpful. So it sounds like you had a pretty strong daily routine and structure, right? Even though you were kind of by yourself a lot, you, your day was pretty scheduled out and you were very active. Were you maintaining kind of mentally active too in addition to video games? What other things did you do to kind of keep yourself entertained? Um, you know, I do. I read a lot. Um, I definitely try to um, do some sort of meditation. I'm not great at meditation, but I've gotten into that when I need to kind of take a break and get away from things. Um, but, you know, a lot of it and my mental um, health journey, I've found that like my thing is talking to the people around me that helps me the most when I need to, you know, vent or do something, but just like getting distracted and hearing about other people and people I love, you know, seeing what they're doing in their life, that kind of makes me feel at best. Great. So now we're fast forwarding and now you're playing in Seattle and you're traveling still during pandemic. What was this shift like? Yeah, it's been it's been different. It's been um, a, a season to remember, I'd say the, um, you know, being safe and being able to travel has been much nicer than being stuck in a bubble. But you know, just being aware and um, always cautious of, you know, what you're doing, where you're going and um, making sure that, you know, we all take care of ourselves as much as we can because, you know, we don't have that specific protection of the bubble. But um, it has been nice. My family's come to visit and I've been able to see people that I love. So that's been that's been great. 
Wonderful. So you also became a champion speaking up for mental health, you know, about during this time, maybe started a little bit before pandemic, but what was the catalyst for you to say, I want to speak up about my own experiences. I want to inspire other people. I want to tell people that it's important for them to share and to get help when they need help. So what was the catalyst of you deciding to take this advocacy role? Yeah, I mean, that was a, for me, that was a big moment. Uh, I just kind of had this realization like during the pandemic, everyone's at home, you know, we're all going through something. And I think I had, I had talked to uh, a few people um, just about how they were feeling. And I think I did, I did a, a panel for um, girls in sports and I kind of started you know, feeling like this is something important that I should talk about and share, you know, my own story, because I've had my own journey to get to this point, um, still going through journey every day to continue to work on my mental health. But it was it was the the whole aspect of we're all in this pandemic together. And that's the truth of it. And so if I can share my story and help one person, then it'll be worth it. And once I did, you know, I got so many messages, so much support, um, so many people that, you know, just reached out and said that they have been through something similar and there or that they're, you know, they appreciate it because, you know, they want to get help too now. And I thought that was like something that made me just realize like, this is really important to talk about. So it sounds like you received very positive feedback on speaking out. Mm -hmm. So at the time when you were struggling yourself, did friends reach out to help you? Kind of who was there for you? And what was it that had the most important and meaningful impact that was supportive for you? And maybe what was something that kind of well wishes tried to do to support you, but they didn't quite go the right way about it, um, that maybe didn't feel that good or wasn't that helpful? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's always ways that you can approach people. And the, the thing is, everyone has a different um, way that they're going to need help, want help, get help. And so there's no like one person or one solution fits all. Um, I think one of the biggest things is my sister does a good job of letting me just be when I'm feeling. Um, she doesn't like try to you know, this is what you should do to fix it. Or this is what she lets me and has always talked to me to like, let myself feel my emotions and listen to me. And um, that's something that really helps me a lot is, you know, not necessarily needing a solution right in, in the moment. Sometimes it's okay to just feel those feelings and let it all out and let, you know, something um, happen when it needs to. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a biggest fan of when people are like, like, what's wrong? Why are you feeling this way? Da, da, da. Like, it's just so not attacking, but sometimes there's no answer. And that just is, I'm not feeling good. And that's the end of it. <laughs> so what I'm hearing you say is that even when you're dealing with extraordinary circumstances, and when you're not feeling well, having people who surround you and to give you space, right, and be there when you need them kind of but back off if you need to kind of take a moment for yourself is really important. Being physically active, um, engage play, play time, right? Engaging with somebody in a very playful way, staying socially connected and meditating and having some grounding and gratitude practices are some of the coping tools that helped you get through some of the challenging times. Is that right? Absolutely. So what are some stereotypes about mental health and mental illness that you find, you know, very, very distressing to you? Kind of what are some myths that you would like to dispel and kind of really clear the air on some areas i think the biggest thing is just you know some people hear you know someone talk about mental health or speak on it and share and then people just say that you're weak or mentally weak and i think that's the biggest like just incorrect statement there is there's nothing wrong with <laughs> being able to understand your feelings and being emotional and, you know, knowing that you need help sometimes and knowing that you're going to have bad days. Uh, we all have a mental health journey and they're all different and unique, but there's definitely nothing, nothing weak or, you know, soft about being open about mental health. 
Well, thank you so much for being the spokesperson and just being really a great example. And last question I have for you, and I'm sure our audience is gonna have a lot of questions for you, but my last question is what's optimal wellness for you? You know, we all have our own definition of what optimal wellness is for us. What are the, some key components of optimal wellness for you, the way you define it? Um, optimal wellness for me is just being in a place where I feel happy and I'm, you know, excited to be doing what I'm doing. Um, I think being happy is the biggest thing that I strive for every day to find the little things that make me happy. And it's not always like the big picture, like I want to be happy. It might be like, oh, I want to get a coffee today and that'll make me happy this morning. Something small, but just making sure that I take a moment to appreciate, you know, where I am, what I'm doing and let that kind of guide my positive thinking. That's really beautiful. So what you're saying is awareness of small moments of gratitude is what constitutes a well day, right? And a well life. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. So now we're going to uh, speak with our next uh, speaker, Dr. Arpan Wagre. Arpan, hello. Hi. And, hi, how are you? Doing well, thank you. So I have a question for you. Um, you have many roles. Um, and I'm sure from the beginning of pandemic, your responsibilities and um, kind of the level of how busy you are and what you have to do increased even significantly. You are a physician, you're an administrator, you're a community volunteer, you were instrumental in identifying best practices and mobilizing them very quickly to support healthcare staff in your health system, to bring it to the community. Um, so since the beginning of pandemic, your job, I would imagine, became very, very demanding. So what are some of the best organizational practices that maybe you translate to your own life and how do you maintain your own optimal wellness while you're helping so many other people, including healthcare providers and patients, to maintain their wellness? What are some biggest challenges that have been for you and some silver linings and maybe some big takeaways that would be applicable to our audience? Well, thank you. That was a beautiful but very long question with multiple things over there. And before I, I get into that, I wanted to take a moment and acknowledge and thank Katie Lou for, for speaking so eloquently and straight from the heart, um, using your platform and being able to, to share this. Uh, is it really makes a huge difference. So so thank you. And I have two daughters who are diehard Seattle Storm fans. And today when I told them I'm going to be speaking and Katie Lou is on the panel, they actually felt for the first time that dad does something that's somewhat important. So uh, thank you for, for everything you're doing. And and uh, Tatiana, great question. And I'm, I'm going to break it down because there are multiple things you, you, you asked over there. Uh, you know, starting off, so we so in my role, I serve at Swedish and a part of the Providence Health System as well. And the very first COVID positive patient who was hospitalized uh, was was admitted to our Providence Everett campus. Uh, and at that time, very shortly after, um, we, you know, our chief clinical officer who had worked with the Ebola virus and, and others had had recognized that that this is something we need to pay close attention to, and and recognize the potential impact it might have on the healthcare workforce. Um, so, very early on, and as this started progressing, I was tasked with the uh, responsibility to try to make sure that we put in place a system where, if any of our healthcare uh, you know, we call everyone who works in our system a caregiver. Any of our health caregivers um, need help for themselves that we make it absolutely easy, make seamless access to care based on their needs and preference. So the first thing that I set out to do at that point was um, to create a very simple um, digital front door. So like a stress meter is what we created with simple smiley faces that then people uh, people were getting overwhelmed with the amount of information being sent to them. And, you know, everybody was at a different place. And so just a very simple uh, stress meter that had, you know, smiley faces, you know, how are you doing today? Just like the 
mood barometer test that you did earlier. And based on where people were, they click on that, it would open up um, resources that would match up to where their level of stress are, and they could then choose something based on their needs and preference. So for example, you know, when people were in the mild stress range, many people wanted self-help resources. But when you want self-help, you, you, you go into a Google search and you're either overwhelmed or underwhelmed with what's there. You just have all this stuff thrown at. So how do you how do you really get what you find most meaningful based on your needs? So we partnered uh, with uh, with UCSD and uh, so actually sorry UC Berkeley and 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 a group um, that uh, you know created something called Credible Mind. So you know you go on there and then you say I need help with say parenting during the pandemic and my preferred medium of learning is say a podcast or video and you put that in and just like you have a Yelp five star rating you kind of have things show up so so that was you know extremely powerful people found that very helpful we found that the most commonly viewed topic among the healthcare workers earlier on was compassion fatigue so you know it just tells you something of how people were feeling and where they were going now um, you know, as you move along, there we found that many people in the mild stress range actually preferred telespiritual help. So that was put in there as an option. Uh, there were many people who just were overwhelmed with everything happening and wanted a phone a friend option. So we made sure that there was, you know, same day access to a therapist based on, on you know, uh, and, and so they could, they could get same day access to a therapist and so on. So, and then, you know, self-help resources as well. So this was just one of the first things, but then we also recognized that, that most people who need help um, were probably suffering in silence. And so how do we make sure that we're proactively reaching out to people? And so we have then put on, you know, we, we then put together a program under the umbrella of No One Cares Alone, where we kind of have a battle buddy system and reaching out to each other and, and showing up for each other, just the basic stuff that we should be doing. And, and that's something that's continuing, understanding, you know, what are the pebbles in your shoe and how do we help you, um, you know, navigate where you're at? Um, well, you know, so so this has worked and, you know, we had about 30,000 of our caregivers utilize this particular tool. Um, so we've talked a lot about depression, anxiety, but, you know, in today's message, I, I also wanted to spend a moment, you know, we there's so many lessons that we all learned from the pandemic. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about depression, anxiety, PTSD, but a very important thing that I wanted to share, and I wanted to leave us with a message of hope, because as I was thinking about this, the power of gratitude and, and what you did when uh, when um, Titania, uh, Titania asked you um, to, to express, you know, think about something you're grateful for and express the emotion you're experiencing. You know, it was just so gratifying for me to see love and joy and hope. And then, you know, among all the, the, the word cloud, yes, there were a lot of negative things, but I did see a word that said hopeful. I did see some, some positive Positive things. So how how do we think about the concept of post traumatic growth? You know, positive mental shift that's experienced as a result of adversity. You know, resilience essentially doesn't mean bouncing back to the way to bouncing back to normal. You know, it means being transformed to a new normal. Uh, to be resilient is uh, you know in in some ways allowing oneself to be changed to see the cracks in the self and 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 let the light shine through to become stronger and and this concept is so poetically described in the japanese concept of kintsugi where you know when pottery is broken the the art of putting together broken pottery with gold uh you know essentially built on the idea that you know we embrace imperfections uh, and you can create an even stronger and more beautiful form of art. Um, lastly, you know, as I think about the whole journey and, and uh, you know, one particular story comes to mind, you know, our nurses who were true heroes during, during this very difficult time, um, I recall an instance where earlier during the pandemic on one of our COVID units, um, our nursing staff got together and had implemented a policy where at the end of the shift, they all got together and they talked about the one thing that made them smile that day. Um, and and uh, they were kind enough to allow me to join them in one of the sessions. And, and it was fascinating because there was one particular patient that day who was admitted uh, who had advanced dementia and was COVID positive and um, could not follow directions, was frequently coming out of his room, and, and the nurse needed to go back, redirect him about 20 times through the course of that shift. She was physically and emotionally exhausted, 
But when she talked about the one thing that made her smile that day, she talked about that particular patient because during the course of caring for him, she had one moment where she could do a FaceTime visit with, with him and his nephew, whom he recognized and just was you know lit up and was super happy. So I think these, these little things matter so much and the power of gratitude and hope and how do we how do we take something that's that was terrible in adversity and and we emerge stronger from here and the last thing i'll say is ending with the quote from um maya angelo um and i think katie lou articulated this so eloquently and this kind of piggybacks on some uh, on, on what she said you know if you're always trying to be normal you will never know how amazing you actually can be so thank you so much and happy to answer, you know, any questions, Satana, anything else that I could talk about. Yeah. Thank you so very much. I love the concept of, you know, Kinsuki where you actually become more beautiful by experiencing scars and life's adversities. I think that's just so inspiring. And the quote that you shared is very inspiring too. So as a physician, what are some biggest challenges that your patients come to you with, right? And you have an opportunity to see them progress and get better in addition to gratitude, in addition to staying physically and mentally active. What else works well for people, you know, especially for older adults? What do they find most supportive? And how can all of us uh, can reach out and be part of a solution and part of a community supporting those in our community? Again, we focus on all the people who may not feel safe kind of really getting out and still maintaining physical distancing for so long now. Yeah. Well, I love the way you have twice used physical distancing instead of social distancing. And I think that was a part of where I was coming with this. Because earlier on, when we started going through the pandemic, we were constantly using the term social distancing. And in a lot of uh, the elderly patients who I'm so privileged to serve, uh, that was one of the biggest challenges, loneliness, uh, not being able to connect and meet with family. And especially, you know, those who, who lived in certain care settings where uh, they could not see their grandkids or could not uh, go down for, for meals as a group. It started taking a very significant toll. Uh, I think the social isolation and the, the economic dislocation, you know, combined had this very, very profound effect, we did see um, a notable increase in, in clinical conditions like depression, anxiety. So while we're talking about self-help and, and all these tools and techniques, I think it's really important to also acknowledge that, that depression is real, mental illness is real. And when you have clinical conditions like depression, anxiety, there might be a need for professional help. And, and certainly uh, a lot of uh, our patients uh, had, had needed that. But also like very practical, simple things like routine, structure, what worked really well, you think about how technology came to um, support us during these very difficult times. You know, uh, my, my grand, my, my, um, my children uh, very close to their grandfather um, who lives in, in India and kind of has been by himself. And, and so regular times to schedule Zoom calls, something for them to look forward to, having, having some structure and, 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 and making the best of staying socially connected despite phys being physically distanced was, was, really, was really important. Uh, mindfulness, staying in the moment is, is really, really important. You know, I think um, the other thing I would say is that we, we frequently get overwhelmed with all these things. And I'm reminded of something my mom used to tell me, um, you know, I cried for a new shoe only till I met a man who cried for a foot. And when you put things in perspective and you see everything that's happening, it, it helps you process and understand things differently, take a step back. So, um, you know, there've been a lot of different things. I don't know if I, I really got to the heart of your question, but I think there, there are multiple different solutions that have worked for, for each of us who are very different individuals. I think you have very inspiring solutions. And last question I have for you, and I'm sure our, our audience has a lot of questions, but my last question for you is, what are some self-care practices that are non-negotiables for you in your life? You know, when you're very busy and have many priorities, what is it that you make sure you do for yourself to maintain your wellness? That is such a beautiful question. You know, I'll, I, I, I used to think of life in terms of, you know, I used to think about the concept of work and life balance. Um, and and that was very hard for me because if you think about work and life balance, you're you're constantly on the edge and I would feel like I'm gonna tilt and fall on, on one way. I'd feel guilty for doing too much at work or 
too much, you know, at home. And and I came to a place where I became more comfortable with the concept of a work and life blend. See, my my role as a father is a very important role for me. My role as a husband is a very important role for me. My role as a physician is an important role. Sim, similarly, a medical director. Each one of these are are very personally and professionally fulfilling for me. So as I've started to think about this as a work life blend and this kind of you know there. I'm going to spend time. So I don't feel guilty if I'm having to take time off from work to go and drop my kid off at school or actually run an errand and do something to help my wife. And and similarly, when I'm having to do some work um, later in the evening when, when the kids are in bed, I, I'm okay with that. So I think I've come to this place. Now, where I do draw a line is is my family time. And I think that is you know the most important thing. My two daughters mean the world to me. So being able to start my day in the morning uh, with my family, having breakfast together is non-negotiable. After that, you know, things evolve. And, and I, so those are a few things and a few rituals that, that we have as a family. Thank you very much. So what I learned from you is that for each of us at home, it's important to uh, get a check of our mood and stress on a regular basis, to kind of have our own mental, or maybe even use a piece of paper barometer of how we're doing so we can triage what are our needs at this moment in time right and that's something everybody can do at home and if we're feeling particularly stressed or particularly sad we really need to reach out we really need to speak out and we need to use the resources there's many vetted resources available out there but really emphasizing the social connection and person-to-person -person connection that we need to celebrate uh, surviving our challenges and that resilience is not about being perfect and untouched, but resilience is really showing up those scars and learning from our experiences and being there for everybody. And that it's very important to think of our life as a work-life blend where we're not feeling guilty and tearing ourselves apart with our multiple responsibilities, but really enjoying them, being aware of what we're doing at the moment we're doing it, doing the best we can, and hopefully kind of having this very synergistic existence. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And our next speaker today is Dr. Tan. And Dr. Tan, I have kind of similar question for you. As a thought leader, as you know, the person to whom organizations and individuals have been coming in for advice, especially since the beginning of pandemic, saying, what are the best practices? What do we do? You know, having this responsibility of really leading those who help others and helping individuals, how do you keep up? with what the best practices and recommendations are. You know, how do you take care of yourself while you have this very significant kind of expansion of your work? And what are some personal challenges, takeaways, silver, li silver linings, and learning opportunities that maybe would be generalizable to all of us at home? Thank you. So Tatiana, thank you. Um, and thank you to all the other speakers. Um, I think uh, we first actually met last year um, earlier in this um, in this pandemic, um, talking about something very similar. And and who would have thought that um, almost a year later we'd be still in this a very um, similar conversation, but with a year of experience. Um, so in my role at ARP, um, I I uh, am part of a larger thought leadership group, but a policy group and a research group. And early on in the pandemic, I was asked to start writing some blogs um, um, as the um, as people were becoming getting up to speed. My first blog was actually about loneliness, and I think we've heard about how it is not just um, it's actually a necessity. You know, we are more than just um, you know creatures with a heart and lung. We we are social creatures, and and there is some research that suggests that for older adults that being lonely chronically is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, um, which means that it is as big and important a risk factor as anything else. And so um, that very issue of uh, making sure that while we remain physically distant, that we do not socially isolate ourselves is critical. And that's all also for all ages. There has been research that suggests that uh, for people who are younger, um, that the issue of social isolation actually has been even more difficult during this pandemic because it re represents a, a large departure of their previous lives. The next article I wrote was on accessing mental health. And I was thinking about my own Asian American community where um, there is a stigma associated with, um, with seeking mental health services. And you see that in many communities um, that I belong to from 
um, um, the medical community to um, 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 uh, um, to um, sometimes even at work. And I think there it's important to realize that these are, are issues that we all deal with um, and that they um, that um, that just as um, that um, in in trying to not address your feelings of, of depression and anxiety and not you actually are harming yourself even further. And I was thinking about one particular situation where, you know, in, when my, within my own Asian American culture, we were actually allowed to deal with these issues. And that was grief. And that was the third blog I wrote. You know, grief is, uh, especially around the death of a loved one, is a place where we have a lot of cultural rituals that allow us to acknowledge the pain and the loss that we feel. Uh, but grief is more than just how you feel. It's a process. And the goal is that as you go through that process of grief, you find yourself in a better place. And if you're unable to, um, you get what you know the um, psychologists will call complicated grief. And that for me was where it really became clear why seeking mental health when uh, access uh, mental health services when you need it is so critical because that's that process that allows you to uh, acknowledge those emotions and seek help. And grief not only comes from, say, when you lose a loved one, which sadly has been very frequent for these past uh, these past months, but also when you lose something that's important to you, a, a job, a routine, a friendship, a way of life. And so in many ways, we are all grieving, right? And and um, and and I think that's really uh, that's that's been a, I think a a part of this um, the narrative of this. And and how do what how does one deal with grief? It's everyone does it differently. For some, it's by um, seeking new purpose. Um, I think um, Kelly talked about um, her interest in social justice and how one finds new meaning. Talking about resilience, that one uh, finds um, finds oneself transformed by these experiences. Um, it's by seeking friends out. Uh, I started reconnecting with friends that I knew when I was training at UCSF in San Francisco. One of them is now in Washington State in Seattle. I'm in Washington, D.C. And, you know, every other week, there are about four of us who still get together. Um, and that technology, uh, I love how, uh, Kaylu, you talked about um, video games. My son is uh, now a regular Magic the Gathering uh, player with um, his uncle, my my wife's brother um, and and my you know the my brother-in-law has taught my son the fine art of trash talking, which is probably something that's best taught by someone who's not your parent, right? And so it it is also this issue of gratefulness, these small moments of gratefulness that that you talk about. And we know um, I'm thinking about my my training in integrative medicine that gratefulness as a form of meditation can also be a part of of helping people feel better. So that's what I try to do. Um, and, and trying to build it into that routine. I, I love where Arpan, you talked about this uh, work-life blend, right? And so especially it's it's all it's all blended together. Um, so how does one integrate the you know the one the things that one needs, the things that one um, wants and things that you need to do throughout the day? When, um, I, before the pandemic I uh, was uh, I belonged to a gym and I rarely went. Um, but um, now we have a dog, right? And so every morning I wake up and I see the dog. And if I don't walk the dog, there will be consequences. And so it may be raining, but I end up walking the dog. Um, and this morning, uh, the second day of school, in-person school for my daughter, second grade, I uh, scooted with her an hour and a half, I'm sorry, a mile and a half to and back from her school. That for me was a great opportunity for us just to chat she and me just walking together. Sometimes she scoots, sometimes I kind of push her, sometimes I walk with it. But it's it's trying to find um, those opportunities to integrate uh, the physical activity that I need, the social activity with my, um, with my daughter. Or last year I spent a monthly session of Dungeons and Dragons, that old fashioned game um, online with uh, six fifth graders once a weekly. So it's, it's really trying to find those um, those, uh, you know, um, ways to integrate it within your own life. Um, and I think that for me has um, been a, a very necessary part, but, uh, um, you know, and, and today I also got to experience um, something I used to, my favorite part of the day, which was missing my children. And I, I, tell my, I told my daughter that when I picked her up, I used to miss missing you. And now I get to miss you again. And that was nice.
Thank you very much. I love that theme that kind of comes through our speakers' presentations about importance of gratitude, about importance of bringing the element of play into your life. And I have a question for you, Dr. Ten. You are an expert in the benefits of volunteering. Can you talk to our audience about health benefits of doing for others? Yeah. So while when I was a faculty member at Johns Hopkins, we had this randomized control trial of the health benefits of volunteering for a group of, of um, experienced core members. A experienced core is an ARP volunteer opportunity who were quarter time AmeriCorps members. AmeriCorps is a federal program of national domestic civilian service. So think Peace Corps, but within the United States. And often people think of uh, AmeriCorps members as you know, younger people who might be um, disaster service members or working in schools. And in Experience Corps, uh, we would take people who are 15 older and we place them in, in this case, the Baltimore City Public School System, uh, a very difficult school system. Um, and we found that the volunteers uh, um, for the for the women they actually walked more than the control group. It was a, it was an experiment, and for the men um, we actually saw a retention of their hippocampal volume as opposed to controls by looking at their MRIs. And the hippocampus is actually the part of the brain that um, that actually encodes memory. And and the thought is is that similar to what I was saying how. Um, you know, I used to have belong to a gym and I would rarely go, but now that I have a dog, I always walk in the morning and the evening. Similarly for volunteering, it provides that social connection, which is key, which we talked about how loneliness, chronic loneliness can be the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of the impact on your life expectancy. Um, how that social connection, in addition to that mental connection, you're looking at that child, the child's saying, you, how do I teach this child how to read? What is this new math that they're teaching? Sometimes I still don't know, um, or um, or even the physical activity, right? So I've been doing Tai Chi, um, and uh, some of the benefits of Tai Chi is that you kind of stay grounded in your stance, that you cross the midline, that you shift your weight. Well, if you were in one of these kindergarten school um, classrooms, there would be these rapidly moving objects called kindergartners crossing your path. You have to stop. You have to shift your weight. You have to cross your line, and play and volunteering. These are voluntary activities that um, have um, the ability to, to give people purpose, talking about, I think, what um, what Katie Lou talked about. Um, in terms of play, it also lets you, you know, um, get, yeah, get um, um, have sort of that short-term um, stress that can really be relieved because what is play? Play is also another voluntary activity where the outcome has no consequence, right? So, um, but those are important ways that, um, uh, for personally, in terms of your personal stress, you can relieve yourself of stress and also as a way of meeting new people. And that was the case. That's the case in volunteering. And that's the case in, um, you know, trying to think about ways in which we can continue to play, um, even if it's um, through online games with our friends. Fantastic. So what we're learning from you is that doing something without consequence and having an element of service and play can actually help not only preserve but potentially regenerate our brains if yes. if you know yes. we needed a reason to do that in addition to physical exercise right that seems to be a winning combination well thank you so very yes. much yes. we have yes. many questions that came in for all of our speakers so we're going to move to the q a uh, portion of our presentation today and we're scheduled to go till 5 p.m., but good news is we can go a little longer. Uh, we received some wonderful questions, and I'm going to kind of sort your questions and direct them to our speakers. And we're going to start with Katie Lou. Katie Lou, welcome back. Is Katie ready for us? All right, so the question for Katie Lou, hello. Um, your camera might be a little bit off. Here. So the first question for Katie Lou, Katie, our audience members are really bummed out that you weren't able to compete in Tokyo Olympics. And they just experienced a lot of empathy that um, you were ill and that you weren't able to engage. Uh, and the question is, were you doing anything uh, specific um, while you were recuperating 
from uh, being ill and kind of what helped you get through this challenging time when you were actually physically sick. So the audience wants to know, how did you get through that? Um, yeah, I just stayed talking to my family as much as I could and um, just connected with them. All right. And now you're feeling well, healthy, everything's good? Yes, everything's good now. Awesome. I have a hard question for you. So feel free to call into our, you know, um, other experts if you want a um, little bit of help ex answering it. It's a hypothetical question. I don't know if you have a lived experience to relate to, but it's an important question. So the question from the audience is, have you ever experienced getting deeply hurt by a person that you're trying to explain your pain to? and being left alone after telling your story and basically not being acknowledged. So you can answer it as a hypothetical or call in for support from your other speakers. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I ever experienced that as much, but mainly because, you know, for me, I kind of hid everything I was feeling. I didn't accept that I needed help for the longest time. It took me forever to um, reach out for help. So like, even at my lowest times, I was always making excuses that, you know, I shouldn't feel this way or, um, you know, I'm still playing well, I still have all this, like, I'm, I don't need to talk to anybody. Like, I always had an excuse. And so for, for me, um, you know, I'm sure um, one of the other doctors can, you know, tell how the best way to cope with that is. But, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of support around me. That's really very fortunate that every time you speak up and express your feelings, people acknowledge it and kind of stay witness to what you're saying. So let's see if maybe Arpan or Irvin would like to answer this question. What happens when you bare your soul to someone and they don't kind of witness your pain and don't offer you the support? How do you pivot? Um, Arpin, if you wanted to, um, to start, um, or I could offer maybe one or two suggestions. I'll, I'll let you go first. It's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that's in part why I think often seeking, um, um, when you're in a position where you need mental health services, that's one of the advantages of having that person, that professional who um, who is trained and who is there to provide that, that uh, support and insight. Um, I think those, that's an important piece where, um, you know, I think where sometimes when, especially when the difficulty you're having is with someone you love, it's hard to, for individuals sometimes to um, disentangle how they may want to help you and how they are also entangled in the issue that you have. Um, other ways I've seen people talk about it is writing it down in a journal, journaling and, and sort of um, having that conversation. And sometimes it, it's sometimes it's as important to voice your pain and acknowledge what you're feeling. I mean, I think um, I think this, this idea of being hopeful and grateful is important, but a lot of times we've, we've heard in this conversation that the ability to acknowledge one's own emotions are important and, and critical. Um, and I think that, you know, that's a, a necessary part of grief. One cannot grief grieve without feeling sad. So that may be another piece. And um, I've sometimes also thought about this myself in, in terms of, you know, when you need a certain response that uh, from a person who's close to you, and you've always wanted that response, sometimes it's also important to ask yourself, and what if you got the response that you wanted? And how would that make you feel? And to focus on how that would change yourself is another opportunity to think about where um, the, the you always you, you know, this is not always the case. There are times when you have that power within you to make that change, no matter what the other person says. And then, um, and then there's advice from my daughter when she's upset at her father, um, and that, but she still needs to be comforted. Sometimes she'll she'll get comfort from me, but there's always her dog. And I think that there's a important connection that people can have with animals that they can provide tremendous amount of support. But I think um, the important thing is when, especially when one is in significant distress, make sure that um, you you know what resources are available, especially if um, if um, if it's issues of serious depression or um, 
thoughts about hurting oneself, I think those are important places where accessing mental health services is important. No, that's so so well said, Erwin. I think the only thing I would add over there would be, um, you know, one of the efforts we've had. So sometimes you talk to people, it's it's not that they don't care. Many times they might not completely understand what clinical depression is. I think Katie Lou really covered that so well. She said, well, I'm playing really well. I'm at the high point in my career. I shouldn't be feeling this way, right? That's, that's, that's not uncommon. And so other people might not understand that. So really a increasing mental health literacy, um, you know, increasing, you know, democratizing knowledge in a way, allowing people to understand what this is. You know, one of the things we've been taking on at our health system is, you know, everybody in the health system mostly is trained in schools, you're trained with CPR, you know, but what's the emotional equivalent of CPR? How do we train people in that eCPR, that emotional CPR, where you know how to look out for certain things and you can actually have a, a way in which you can turn you know, show up for each other and have a real conversation, open that door. You know, externally, people who are suffering look the same as those who are not. It's really hard to, to make out, you know, what's going on. So starting a real conversation is important um, and, and being able to train people, educate them about what this is. You know, we started a campaign around my mental health matters, but then there's a, a, a side to it that goes with it, which is your mental health matters. How do I look out for my colleagues? And if somebody seems that they're a little more withdrawn, they're a little more disengaged, they're burnt out, like how do I, how do I start a conversation with them and how do I genuinely show up for them? Skills and how to respond when people reach out to you is really important. Uh, next question is for you, Arpan. Uh, our audience is asking, how can they be most helpful? How do they see warning signs? How would they know something might be wrong and they need to prompt and be there for somebody else? So how do they learn this mental health literacy that you're talking about? There are a lot of different ways, depending on how much you want to go into this. Uh, I mean, there's, first of all, the most basic thing, we're human beings, as Irwin described, and we're, you know, we're, we're social creatures. We, we long connection. And, and there's, there's a lot of value in genuinely showing up to each other, for each other, having real conversations. But if you are interested in learning more, there's so much that we can do. You know, I mentioned there, there's, you know, there's mental health first aid training. Uh, this started um, out of Australia uh, and has gained a lot of popularity through the National Council over here. And, and I think there, there are courses like that that help you, help every one of us gain the, the required skill sets to be able to show up for each other. Because mental health, you know, it's, it's not the responsibility or I think it's not, it's not possible to expect that a few psych psychiatrists or psychologists are really going to you know, take care of this. What we need is our whole community uh, because people are not going to show up always with their therapist or psychiatrist. They might show up, um, you know, at their workplace with, with someone and, and being able to have a conversation and support people and gain that knowledge is really critical. So depending on how much people want to go in, there are multiple different ways in which you can enhance your knowledge base and truly be there to support each other. Wonderful. And now you've been one of the leaders in very quickly pivoting to uh, telehealth. So for those of us in the audience who maybe haven't taken advantage of this amazing resource, what encouragement would you give? And a question from the audience is, do you see that people are more receptive to asking for help? Are people using kind of the, the available kind of easy from home uh, type of support that's accessible to all of us right now? Yeah, so I've been I've been a, a a strong advocate for telehealth way before the pandemic. Um, so you know we we had 36 hospitals across the province system that are in rural critical access uh, settings where there was no access to mental health. Uh, so that was a you know we felt that it would be it's our moral responsibility to make sure that if somebody trusts us with their care, that we always care for them as a whole person, mind, body, spirit, irrespective of where they present. So I've been working on this for, for three, four years prior to the pandemic. Uh, the adoption was slower. Uh, there were a lot of challenges with reimbursement and payment. But once the pandemic came, that was one of the silver linings which changed everything. Um, I will say, of course, you know, it's not to replace a human being. And sometimes there are a lot, there's a lot of value of being there in person with someone. But 
uh, overall, our experience has been that most patients have actually found great value. There are a lot of randomized controlled trials that look at the clinical effectiveness, patient engagement, and satisfaction with telehealth versus in-person, and they're comparable. So, so we have the evidence base. Um, there are certain patient populations who've actually benefited greatly. Uh, we, we, you know, many people might recognize, but but postpartum depression is the most common complication of childbearing. So, so think about that for a second. More common than gestational diabetes. Yet every new mom gets a glucola test, but how many actually get a depression screening tool? And and so that's a population where you know, especially when there's another young kid at home, and we say, well you have to come for weekly psychotherapy and they have to figure out childcare, they have a new baby and, you, and then they're non-compliant. Uh, what does that even mean? You know, we've created a system that doesn't work for them. So, so telehealth has been very well accepted over there. It's really helped a lot of them. Like, and then, and then some people with a lot of social anxiety, um, you know, that, and then, and then certain populations where transportation is hard and childcare. So all these things there, so there've been significant advantages. We found a uh, significant decrease in no-show rates and patient engagement in patients with substance uh, use disorders. Um, and, you know, so teletherapy has worked well. So a lot of advantages. And I think as we move forward, this is one part of it. It's not to replace, you know, a human being. There's teletherapy. There's other technology-based solutions. Uh, but all this with with genuine compassion. Um, you know, that that's the secret sauce in being able to bring this together. Thank you so very much. So using telehealth, using crisis line, there's peer-to-peer -peer support line specific to older adults uh, would be wonderful resources to use. Next question is for Katie. Katie. How do you manage to get through dark, rainy Seattle winters? What helps you? Uh, I actually haven't been here for a Seattle winter yet, but hopefully I'll experience it. And I mean, I don't really know. If anyone has any tips, let me know. Dr. Tan, we're coming to you for your expertise on helping Katie get through her first dark, rainy Seattle winter and all of us at home. Um, uh, so I actually, um, I think I actually grew up in Connecticut. Um, so um, I'm, I'm, you probably are more familiar with, with the weather there. Um, I think that, um, you know, I think again, it's, it's you know, um, thinking about how I have affect, I've changed my life as a, um, as a, to get the things I need as a parent. Um, I think it's finding those, um, those opportunities, no matter where you are to seize the, um, Season opportunities to be outside to enjoy activities that you still enjoy. I mean, especially the outdoors. I think um, uh, you know if you want, if one can acquire a taste for hiking uh, or skiing or um, you know those remain uh, one of the safest uh, ways to uh, be physically active, socially um, um, active, and uh, yeah, physically distanced. Um, so I think those are um, those represent ways in which we can think about it. Um, you know, you know, if, if for people who have you know seasonal affective disorder, they they should talk to their um, their providers, their you know, uh, whether it be um, you know uh, their their physician, nurse practitioner uh, about uh, specific uh, the specific need for light. Uh, but I think that um, that there is something uh, amazingly restorative about being outdoors. Um, whether it's even letting that window op um, be open um, in your house, uh, being able, if you can, safely walk. And that's where you know, these issues of disparities really come to mind um, and the ability to, um, they, some people call it forest bathing, to be in a forest, um, to be in a beautiful location. Um, so those are some ideas. Um, and then to potentially acquire that, that uh, appreciation for a be beautiful location where it's raining. The only thing, Tatania, that I may add uh, is for those who actually this this so there's just dealing with the 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 dark gray winters, but but sometimes it could actually be a clinical condition where we get to seasonal affective disorder, which unfortunately is is not uncommon over here. Uh, so I do think talking to your primary care physician, there are easy treatments, including a, a light box, 10,000 Lux light works very, very well, uh, making sure that you're talking to your primary care physician, checking vitamin D levels. So some of the basic stuff also is probably gonna be important. Thank you. So staying with the topic of optimal wellness, what role does nutrition and diet have in maintaining this wellness? 
would anybody like to take that question? Not the 10. I think it's <laughs> hard, I think, you know, for all of us who, uh, who are, you know, to be grateful, to be lucky enough to be able to work from home, but find ourselves potentially too close to the refrigerator and having it too conveniently located. Um, so I think uh, we know that, um, I think I'm looking at the data from the Stanford Longevity Center that prior to the pandemic, um, people who work at a desk were sitting around six hours a day. And um, subsequently, uh, those of us lucky enough to have, um, you know, or have jobs that are called knowledge jobs are sitting eight hours a day. And that has tremendous amount of effects on our health. Um, so it, again, it's, it's about how one integrates, um, integrates um, uh, physical activity and also um, changes in one's diet. Um, and uh, the advice for diet, again, it, there's a tremendous amount of food insecurity that's occurred also as people have lost jobs and wages. But um, um, sort of the, you know, I think it was Michael Pollan who said, eat food, um, um, mostly plants and in moderation. And the, those are some basic um, concepts. But I think, you know, reaching out also and talking to a dietitian or nutritionist is critical. Um, sadly, I'm thinking that my own medical education, we didn't really get trained in nutrition, and I wasn't really um, trained in, in you know the um, you know the value of like you know the Mediterranean diet and how that can affect the your inflammation levels until I did an integrative medicine fellowship. Uh, but um, I would say that again, this idea of um, you know eating food, food that your your ancestors have recognized as food, um, you know mostly plants. And um, and in moderation is is one start, but also um, you know understanding that that's a critical part of your health. Brain healthy diet, as as Erwin described, and and I think true, you know there is a there is a gap in training. I completely agree with you. I think only till I started uh, understanding and learning more about you know techniques to help boost cognition and what's a brain healthy diet and you know that's where you but but the mediterranean diet's one where there's a lot of um there's some research and i think that that's probably one place where people could go towards oh yeah and sitting is the new smoking i don't know if you've all read that but um yeah there's, there's so data movement to, yeah, healthy so, diet yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And, you know i'm talking about telemedicine uh you know i i recently had about a year ago, a, not recently, a year ago, I guess, a physical therapy appointment that was a tele um, a telemedicine appointment, and it was ideal because they were they um, the physical therapist was seeing me in in my in my seat in my environment, but the the cause the the environment that was causing me to have um, you know um, um, you know the increased weight and the back pain that's been uh, plaguing me. So you know it's it's um, it's about changing your position. It's making sure that. Um, if you can um, invest in a place where you're um, a, a good chair, um, you know, your computer, making sure it's at eye level, um, changing positions throughout the day, making sure you stretch your back, um, you know, um, you know, um, yoga is an, I mean, I, I mentioned Tai Chi yoga and, um, and exercise um, and, um, and those sort of um, um, as an example of ways in which you can, um, you know, help maintain your back. There's, a lot of good evidence uh, from the American College of uh, Internal Medicine that that these um, non-pharmaceutical, non-drug related interventions are often the first line treatment in, in addressing uh, mild to moderate acute and um, chronic back pain. So um, those are, are things to consider. And, and I think part of this also is, um, I remember when my, uh, my wife uh, first signed me up for my first yoga class ever, it was a, a, a local yoga studio and it was for, uh, it was, the class was only for, for men, for, for men who had never taken yoga before. And I think that was fantastic. It was uh, a way in which um, uh, people can think about these, um, you know, valuable interventions that they may, for whatever reason, not picture that, that um, them, themselves ever doing. And I think that's part of it as well, uh, part of personal growth for me um, and the value of yoga. Thank you. Katie Lou as an athlete, do you want to weigh in on healthy diet? 
Yeah, I and mean, for treatment. athletes and for everyone, I think eating healthy and um, fueling your body right is, you know, one of the most important things you can do for your health physically and mentally, because it just gives you more energy, makes you feel better. And, you know, when you're eating right and exercising, you have more energy to do things. And I'm not, you know, a doctor or anything like that, but I, I think that um, making sure that you take care of those things gives you um, a better feeling overall and like makes you happier. Um, personally, that's what works for me. I am all, I'm a fan of yoga and doing that. So that's something I try to incorporate um, as much as I can into my life. You bring up a, such an important concept of food as fuel, not as like entertainment. So how do you fuel your body for optimal performance is so important. So while we're staying in different components of wellness, our audience wants to know how therapeutic are the pets? What does the science tell us about, you know, our pandemic puppies and kittens and our old friends, you know, at home? There is some evidence for longitudinal study, like, you know, there's no, the evidence is looking at population. So there, it's not an experiment. You can't define a cause, uh, a specific cause, but there is some evidence that suggests that I think the evidence potentially is best in dogs, um, that there are some potential health benefits. And that could be associated with the fact that um, you got to walk the dog. Just, just, you have to walk the dog. Um, and, um, but I think that, um, I think for my own personal experience, I think that that has shown to be an important part of my own life. Um, and I think um, um, I think it's it's the fact that uh, as human beings, we can form important, uh, uh, significant relationships with other human beings, and also with other creatures as well. So I think, um, yeah. So I think I would I would say yes. And um, and in addition, also there is um, one of the references in is a uh, is an article that I wrote with. Um, a, um, a rehabilitation doctor on this idea of prehab. So the idea is, so rehab is after an injury or surgery, when you um, try to recover um, um, or even go beyond what you previously had. Like for example, if you've had a severe arthritis and you have a new joint, you actually be better off than you were previously. Prehab is what you do before the surgery. And the idea there was taking those principles and, and thinking exactly what a uh, what uh, Katie Lee, you must do on a daily uh, daily basis for your own training, as uh, as a top line athlete, about um, you know, as we think about the challenges that we all uh, might face, whether it's a surgery that you know is going to happen, or the potential of being um, infected with uh, COVID nineteen, how does one uh, prepare for that? And um, it's always a good time to consider smoking if you're smoking. I mean that that just goes beyond saying. But also um, making sure that um, you maintain your, um, you know, your uh, your physical acti regular physical activity, make this issue of diet, um, getting enough sleep. Um, that's the other piece. Um, I think um, I've i among many people have probably uh, participated in a little too much binge watching at times. Uh, but I think um, there's good evidence at midlife that um, that um, regular amounts of sleep are important for things as even as as the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. So. Um, those are all pieces, and um, and and as part of that, uh, for me, uh, my my dog Mona is very much a part of that. Wonderful. Pet, pet therapy is common on on our you know inpatient geriatric psychiatry units have been for many years, so I think there's great value in, in that. And there's a lot of research. Thank you so much. Another quick prehab question. We know that um, brain games and kind of cognitive stimulation helps to maintain cognition, but do brain games help for depression and anxiety? I could take a first step and so Irwin, you games. can join in. Yeah. Oh yeah, so brain games. Um, it's hard because a lot of the brain games that you'll see online are basically designed to help you improve how you do on the test, right? Um, so I think there, um, it's it's hard to know um, what the value of them is. There, there was a long, um, you know, I think there is some evidence from an, a, the active trial that there was, um, you know, that you know that there might be some benefits in certain situations. Um, 
one thing I would say is um, the one thing that I think has been proven to be very, a very strong associate in terms of being protective, in terms of uh, brain, uh, protecting your brain has been education. So I think that, you know, I think um, if you're, um, you're um, so I would definitely encourage that on principle. It's, it's associated with um, healthier longevity. It's associated with lower risk of, of, um, of, of, the, of depression, um, sorry, the lower risk of, um, of dementia. So I think that's an example of where um, cognitively clearly has value. It's just um, uh, we're still learning, I think. And, and Arpin, you may have more recent data, uh, but, um, but I think the other piece that I wouldn't, I wouldn't d discount is that games in which there is a social component um, or games in which there is a physical component I think there is clear evidence to suggest um, that um, those are beneficial and should be encouraged. Yeah, Arpin, what are I, your thoughts? I mean, yeah, no, I think you, you captured the essence of it. I, I recall a study that was done out of Germany where essentially they looked at certain uh, domains of, de so depression's a broad, you know, depression's a cluster of many symptoms, right? So where they found the benefit of action video games was in certain domains of depression. So the symptoms of rumination when people were constantly fixated on certain things and weren't able to turn that off, uh, there was benefit over there. And then just like Urban pointed out, uh, sometimes in depression, you have subjective and objective um, you know, deficits in your cognition. And that's where they actually found a significant improvement. Uh, beyond that, I don't know if I you know, there's there's studies that say that it actually helps with depression. Maybe there are, uh, but I think with these some of these domains within depression, like rumination and cognition, there's definitely some evidence. Uh, my, I have a last uh, formal question for Katie Lou. Katie Lou, um, the audience would like to know what advice would you give to your younger self to keep striving to achieve championship mindset. Could you have set yourself up even better, though, although you've done a fantastic job? And what advice would you give to yourself, kind of looking back? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing that I would tell myself is to just believe in myself more and be positive. One of the biggest things that um, I didn't even realize I was doing until I was able to get help was that I tend to negative self-talk a lot and um, I would do that all the time when I was younger and I didn't ever think or know that there was anything wrong with what I was doing until you know I started really trying to figure out why I was feeling so bad all the time and you know half of it is just how you speak to yourself and so the biggest thing for me that I would tell myself at a younger age is just like to embrace what you're doing enjoy it and give yourself a break sometimes there's always there's always going to be another day there's always going to be you know another basket to shoot and <laughs> you don't have to be so hard on yourself all the time thank you so very much so today we learned from katie that it's really important to maintain physical activity social connection play meditation awareness moments of gratitude do not engage in negative self-talk and give yourself a break in order to be uh, at your optimal top wellness as an elite athlete thank you so much katie and thank you for your advocacy and thank you for leading by example and really inspiring people of all ages to speak up about their challenges and getting help we so much appreciate you and you. uh katie Katie has another engagement, so she's going to be leaving us shortly. But um, uh, Dr. Ar Dr. Tan and Dr. Wagran can stay for a little while longer, and I have a few more questions from the audience. So, Katie, uh, feel free to leave if you, when you need to, but we're going to move along with our Q&A. And thank you so much again. So our thank next so question is about routines. So the audience really appreciated learning about family breakfast as a routine, family play as a routine. Do you have any other daily routines that would be specifically beneficial for older adults? Dr. Overnight. Tan? Sorry, there's laughter in my house. So there's been a lot of play and routine here. <laughs> um, so we actually have, um, a, um, we do like a, I guess a Friday night, uh, movie night, um, and a Saturday, 
um, a game night. Um, I and mean, those are ways in which we try to, um, you know, um, have those of um, those um, those anchors in our life. Um, there is some. There was some. Some studies have suggested there is a, a, a significant value in, in being able to have a um, um, a family dinner together. And um, why is unclear, right? There's a part of it is that dinner is that opportunity for people to bond and to have that social activity. Other others would note that um, um, only certain families are phys- are able because of of money and and and, and schedule um, and their schedules to actually have that um that up op- that you know the opportunity to to um find a time for dinner because someone's not running a second shift so i think um it's uh, but i do think that routine also helps us um do what is important when it's not urgent so we can build it into it like the walking the dog like walking your child to school it lets you do the important things when you might not otherwise do them i think that's that's an important consideration. I was, I'm thinking about my own medical training when we're all taught how to do the history and physical always the same way. So that um, whether it's, you know, five o'clock um, in, um, in the afternoon or five o'clock in the morning, we always do that. And that routine helps us capture what is important while other urgent things might be distracting. Thank you. So, you know, I very similar to to what you described Arun. We, we for us it's meals and and you know there's no electronics allowed at meal time and we talk to each other but i i think that this is a this is a great question and and it's going to be different for different people you know i was as as that question was was shared by tatiana i was thinking of a mentor of mine who who actually taught me, you know, every time she was a nurse and she said, every time you go into a patient's room, uh, you know, you're trained to say, well, what's the matter with you? And then you try to solve and understand. And she said, well, next time you go into a patient's room and every time forward, ask them what matters to you. And and that's how you then build everything you're doing. So, you know, if you want to build family routines, traditions, or even just routines for yourself as an individual, it really starts with what matters to you the most. And then you can start building from there, whether it's, you know, a particular, um, you know, engagement that's social yet or, or meals or what have you. Uh, so that's the way I would think about it. This is very profound. I want to weigh in on the importance of sleep. And uh, one big part of the routine, especially if you're retired, if you don't have to be anywhere in the morning, is to really try to honor a certain window for bedtime and for wake up time. And I think once our sleep is well regulated, once we're well rested, when we're actually waking up in an earlier part of the morning and able to kind of meet that early morning sun, even in um, gloomy Seattle winters, uh, it can really help self-regulation. It really helps to set your entire day off to a good start. So protecting your sleep and developing very good sleep hygiene and sleep routine can really help to maintain wellness. Any other thoughts on sleep? And that's been and hard, right? That, and that's been hard these past uh, 500 or so days. Uh, but it, that is so critical. That is so critical. I remember once I, I heard this quote that one president of one streaming off, um, service asked what he thought about another streaming service as, um, as the competition. And the response was, oh, they're not the competition sleeps the competition. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is so sadly true. So, um, um, and you know, the, the downstream health benefits, health um, benefits and health costs of not having sufficient regular sleep are, are significant. All right, so we encourage you to eat well, to move your body, to sleep and to always reach out, stay social and to do some service. And then in conclusion, I have another hard question for our speakers. And the question is, how do you manage when you started out with a lot of hope, then you transitioned to kind of compassion fatigue, and now you're kind of angry. You know, you're angry that people have different views on how to keep themselves and everybody else safe around them, that, you know, people may be you perceive that people may be reckless with their own and everybody else's health. How do you shift from that anger back to compassion? 
That's a good question, and I, I, I wish I had a, 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 an eloquent answer, but a few thoughts that come to mind, and you know, I think this is something that we've struggled with a lot. Uh, I myself, you know, went from all these, you know, phases of, of, you know, the normal reactions that you have after any any event like this, and getting to a place where there was anger. You know, why are people? You know, I I, I lost a very young relative, 39 years of age, uh, who was healthy with no comorbidities, who when the Delta variant started in India, and he was just not eligible to get the vaccine because he had no medical problems contracted the virus and left behind two four and a half year old daughters and died. And then when I now see people who have the opportunity to get the vaccine or not, it, you know, did cause us to have those those strong emotions like this was avoidable. But I, I do think that coming back to that question, well, compassion, genuine empathy. Uh, and and one of the things that I have learned to do is, you know, they're, they're always going to be, you know, there's there's a different place where people might be coming from. So while this, I might strongly believe, you know, in my idea and the way I'm thinking about this based on the science, uh, it's also important to recognize and validate where people are coming from. And I think this is very hard to do, but how do you disagree without being disagreeable? That's an art. And, and I think the more you try that and you start working with that, you'll find more compassion in your heart and your, your ability to deal with this becomes a little more it becomes, I wouldn't say it would become easier, uh, it becomes more tolerable. I agree. I think it's, you have to, I mean, recognizing the anger that you have, I think is, is a critical piece. But then just like we talk about grief and like, you know, and, and anger is often um, in some of the more um, traditional um, classifications of grief, anger is part of that stage, right? Uh, um, and I think, um, and, but then trying to, to um once you've identified that to um to try to also seek um seek that common humanity and some people do it by you know some people are able to do it uh philosophically some people are are able to do it through sometimes religious traditions um which i think faith-based traditions i think is something that we haven't mentioned and provide a tremendous amount of comfort um cultural wisdom and um um and social connectivity uh, when we find ourselves vulnerable and in need. Um, I think that, um, and, um, and others are, um, you know, are able to do it through, through reading. And, but I think it's, it's, it's something that we all struggle with, but we have to try to strive for it. Um, because if, um, and, and while I may fail at times, it's something that, that um, I, in trying to strive for it, I think it's an important piece of that. It's trying to strive for that compassion. Thank you. So and what also I'm taking hearing- time for yourself. Sorry, and also taking, I mean, all those other issues of self-care, especially if you're, I imagine if you're, you know, we, we see this in caregivers, right? Caregiver burnout. Um, that's um, the, the importance of self-care is key. So what I'm hearing from our expert that the state of anger, even though it may be understandable, it's basically just destroying you, right? So whatever way you can cope to shift from the state of anger to a state of compassion, you don't have to agree, but you can be compassionate, is going to move you closer toward the ultimate wellness. And that's advice from um, our speakers. So I think it's been a really enlightening discussion. I learned myself a lot. And um, my takeaways from Dr. Wagre are wonderful quotes I really, really enjoyed um, just beautiful thoughts that you shared with us. And my biggest takeaway is kind of checking your mood and stress regularly and running intervention that's kind of appropriate for you at that moment in time. Don't wait till you explode and don't wait till the burdens accumulate, but really do some maintenance and collect some data for yourself. Connect with others, redefine what's the new normal is for you. Um, develop kind of a new perspective and look at your work life as a blend while prioritizing family time. What my takeaways from Dr. Tan are is that it's important to allow yourself to grieve and to acknowledge your emotions and that all of us are going through different stages of grief, like nobody uh, escaped from this cha challenging times unaffected. So we're kidding ourselves if we think that there's not some work that we need to do in kind of reconciling our own emotions and helping ourselves and others to heal. That it's really important 
and it can be life-saving to come to this acceptance and acknowledgement that it's really important to seek new purpose and meaning and to be grateful and that this practice of gratitude that you know incorporates others pets play and focuses on spiritual health can also help our longevity and wellness so those are my takeaways i'm sure our audience also has many other wonderful takeaways and i want to thank our speakers and ask if you have any final thoughts or advice to share with us today um arpan what you just said about self-compassion um, I think that's key. It's been hard on all of us. Um, and, um, you know, this, this idea of healthy longevity, it's not something that each of us can have individually. It's a societal characteristic. We need each other. Um, so we need a, we need self-compassion, uh, for ourselves and we need, um, a society, a community, um, that, uh, provides that, uh, for each and um, helps supports us in each, uh, each and one of us on that principle. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I would say practice of gratitude. I think that's one of the more important things that I found beneficial. And I think, you know, recognizing that self-care is no longer, should no longer be seen as just indulgence. It's it's necessary to keep us whole. And, and you know, there's no, there's no vaccine for the mental health part of what's happening. Let's not forget that, right? So I think the more we, we, incorporate self-care in our routines, we're better off going to be. Thank you so very much. Uh, this concludes our session today. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed it. And uh, again, it's been such a pleasure moderating this discussion. Thank you to our panel. And thank you to everyone watching today for joining in. You can find more resources on mental health and resilience on AARP's website at aarp.org forward slash mental health. Today's event is the second in a series of four Get Fit, Be Well special events that AARP is presenting in partnership with the Seattle Storm. Next up is our third event in the Get Fit, Be Well series, the Fitness and Basketball Clinic, with Storm Center Mercedes Russell, Emily Blurton, Head of Sport Performance, and Erin McCaslin, Storm Clinic Director. We'll be going through some fun routines to improve both your strength and flexibility using basketball skills. You can get information and register now at aarp.org forward slash storm. Until then, take care and have a great day.